Hey, good morning. I'm glad you all are here. I'm glad you came back. Um, it's good to see your faces again. I hope you enjoyed having a week off to decompress. I enjoyed having a week off to decompress after Easter. <laughs> that was good for me. I'm so glad that you guys are here. I hope you know that today we are getting ready to start a study of the book of Romans. Um, and gosh, Romans is a great book to study. We're, we'll get into it in a minute. It starts off right out of the gate with a topic that is controversial to us, but would not have been controversial to Paul. Chapter 1 is actually about something entirely different than what it will be about f for, for most of us today, because for Paul, it was a non-issue. So we're going to go ahead and get started, um, and take a minute and open us up in prayer, and then we'll start talking about uh, chapter 1, Romans, and how we, en how we engage the Bible. Um, this study will be like our last one. So if you're joining us uh, online, I know we've had a, a great attendance there too. This is not a study that we're able to live stream. So we're going to do our best to get it uh, posted by Friday morning each week. So it'll be just a little bit behind. Um, but like every other biblical study that we do, I want you to feel free to come when you can come, and don't come if you can't come. Come right back when you're available again. Uh, I, I sometimes we get stuck in this rut where we feel like if we've missed a week or two, we've missed too much, and that's just not the case. If, you, if you're getting to know me better, then you know that I'm going to spend the first half of the class doing a recap of everything we've talked about anyway, so I'm going to get you back up to speed. I'm glad that you're here. Um, Romans is a fantastic book. It is a book that usually is considered to be a book about doctrine and mysticism. And, and because of that, it gives us a great opportunity to understand uh, the process of salvation and what it means to know God. So let's open up with a word of prayer, and then we'll get started with our study today. Gracious and giving God, we're so grateful for the opportunity to come together once again. We're grateful for uh, a good break. We're grateful for a great rest and for the opportunity to have processed everything that we learned as we dialogue together and had relationship together throughout our Hebrew study. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be in this place. We pray that you would guide us through uh, discussion of who you are and who you have called us to be uh, as we seek to better understand the book of Romans. This we ask in your holy name. Amen. All right, friends. Um, Romans is a book that is written by Paul. It's attributed to Paul. That's, that's usually not debated at all. Um, most scholars believe that it's highly likely that it was written by who it says it was written by. And that's, that's a good thing because not every book in the Bible is that way. Um, Romans has 16 chapters, so for us this is going to be a 16-week study. Uh, I don't know yet if we'll take a week off. We probably won't. Uh, well, no, that's not true. We'll end up taking one week off at the end of May when I go to annual conference, but I'll let you know about that ahead of time. So we'll, this will take us into the summer. <clears throat> I want you to go ahead and already start thinking about uh, what you would like to do as a follow-on study next. Your, uh, your surveys were fantastic, and I'm going to put some surveys out towards the end of this study too. My hope is to be able to offer a biblical study during this time slot and then to offer a few topical studies throughout the year at the, in the evening on Thursday nights like we've done. So we're going to take a break because the spiritual growth study just ended on Thursday nights during Lent. Uh, this summer, I'll be teaching a, a topical study on something called systematic theology. One of uh, the results that came back from the survey showed that there is an interest in the church in talking about things like baptism and communion and philosophical theology and philosophy of religion. So what systematic theology will let us do is talk about Trinity and talk about the doctrine of God and Christ and um, eschatology and the sacraments. We'll take one week and we'll talk about each of those things. So that'll be a little bit more of a philosophical kind of a doctrinal study, whereas what we do on Thursday mornings will continue to be um, straight out of the book that we're working on. I'll let you know when we're going to start that study coming up soon. And then um, Linda actually won the, uh, won the silent auction bid for selecting a study for me to teach about. So the way we're going to do that is that we'll set up a, a Sunday night. We'll have a two-hour period on a Sunday night uh, where I'm going to teach about whatever Linda 
would like for me to teach about. So we'll, set, we'll figure that out, and we're going to promote it pretty heavily. It's going to be a good time. We're going to give Linda plenty of time to think about that um, and get back to Kate so that she... Oh, okay. <laughs> we're killing two birds with one stone then. Okay, good. Um, well, we'll probably still follow that format. We'll do a special Sunday night thing coming up here pretty soon. All right, let's go into Romans. Um, the beginning of Romans starts off with the same kind of salutation that's common in Greek letter writing. And that's why you see that same sort of salutation in Paul's letters and in some of the other epistles that are written throughout the, the scriptures. I'm going to continue to teach out of the common English version. Um, so if that's what you have, this will sound, sound normal to you, but I hope you're reading out of a Bible that you enjoy. I want to get us through the, the greeting and salutation. Paul is going to start off his letter with that and with some well wishes, and then he's going to move into justification. So the, the book of Romans is a book that deals with church doctrine or what has come to be called church, church doctrine. When I teach a systematic theology course, that will fall under a category called ecclesiology. Um, that comes from the same word as ecclesiastical, which is a word for church. Ecclesia is the Greek word that is translated to church in the New Testament, and it literally means those who have been called out from or called together out from. Sometimes we say it means those who are set apart, but that's not really what it means. It means those who have been called out from a larger body to create a smaller assembly. That's what ecclesia means. So uh, ecclesiastical refer, is, uses that same, same Greek root word. Uh, ecclesiology is the study of how the church impacts our faith and how we engage our faith through the body of Christ or through the church. Um, so Paul is he's starting this off with a salutation. He's going to move into justification. As we go through Romans, what you're going to see is how the doctrine of the church has developed biblically. If you want to know where we get the idea of justification from, where we get the idea of sanctification and even glorification, where all that comes from, um, Romans is one of the key books that those doctrines come out of. Now, they're corroborated in other books of the Bible for sure, um, but Romans is a primary source document for understanding salvific theology. Salvific theology, or church doctrine, refers to how we understand how we're saved or how we grow. Now, um, in order to talk about justification, Paul is going to enter into a discussion and a dialogue about how we encounter God and whether or not the ways that we sometimes encounter God are appropriate. And then he's going to talk about our propensity toward idolatry and how choosing to ignore what has been revealed to us about God leads to what he refers to as depravity. So we're going to talk about that. Now, if you, if you have not, have anybody, has anybody read Romans 1 in preparation for today? I'm putting you on the spot. Okay. So you know that we're going to talk about homosexuality because Paul brings that up here. Romans is, is one of the books that talks explicitly about homosexuality. Um, that's going to mean that we have to have a discussion about uh, how you approach the Bible and whether or not, well, how you feel about how you approach the Bible literally. Um, what does that mean? It means, do you believe that everything, if you, if you believe that everything in the Bible is literally true, the Bible says it, therefore I must do it, um, then by definition you're a hypocrite. Because I, I, can, I can guarantee you there are a hundred things that you are not doing. So what we have to talk about is how we understand the Bible to be literally true. I had a great sacramental theology professor who said that what we understand about the Scripture is that, the, that, uh, this, that what the Bible tells us, the truth that the Bible communicates, is literally true. Does that mean that every single passage in the Bible is meant to be taken literally? No, it's not, except that it is. What do I mean by that? If a passage in the scriptures is meant as a metaphor, then you should literally take it as a metaphor. You understand that? 
So the question is, how is it meant and how is it intended? How was it intended to, to be communicated through the style of writing that's used? Now, the, the other side of that fence is that we have to be really careful that we don't do backflips to justify something that we want to believe is okay. And so we have this tension between understanding how to approach the Bible, even how to approach the Bible literally, and making sure that we don't err on the side of proof texting. What is proof texting? Do you remember? Pulling a, a scripture verse out of context and or interpreting it. it uh, let me say this a little differently. Proof texting is a form of something called eisegesis. This study is an exegetical study. Exegetical comes from the same root word as exegesis. Exegesis is not a way to refer to the name of Christ. It's spelled differently. Exegesis means that we approach the text of the Bible and we try to let the, te the text teach us or God teach us through the text what the meaning of the text is. Eisegesis means that I come to the text with a predefined notion of what I believe and I interpret the text in a way that supports my belief. Does that make sense? So, if you, uh, now, I'm, I don't want to, yeah, I do. I want to make you mad. So if, if, um, if you are, <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll see if I can do that. Um, I brought this today because it's easier for me to highlight in here. Um, I told you once a story that I read in a course that I took about a man, Jewish man, who wanted to do a, a year of biblical living. Now, before we start down this road, I need you to know where I stand. I believe that uh, Jesus is the word of God because I believe that the Bible states uh, explicitly that Jesus is the word of God. I also believe that the scriptures state that the scriptures are God-breathed and therefore useful for instruction in the church. I believe that the Bible is God's holy revelation to humanity, and I believe that it is one of God's primary means of revelation, self-revelation to humanity. And because of that, I believe that it's holy. I believe that Jesus is God's primary means of self-revelation to humanity. So if you want to know how I feel about the literal truth of the scriptures, I am a person who falls into the camp that the scriptures should be literally interpreted as they were meant to be, as they were written. So if something is written as a metaphor, I believe you should take it as a metaphor. If you're reading uh, an instance where Paul says, this is what I think, then I think you should read that as what Paul thinks. And when he says, this is what God is telling me to write, then I think you need to read that as what God is telling you to write. Um, today, we're going to talk about some of our area, some of the areas in which our belief system contradicts itself. How what we believe individually, how the things that I believe can be self-contradictory. For instance, I can say, um, I can say that. I believe everything in the scriptures, and if, this, if, if it's written in the scriptures, then you should do it. Now, the irony about that is that I've heard that statement from a number of people who will get very angry with what I am about to read you. Um, we talked during Hebrews about the difference between legalism in the Old Covenant and relationship in the New Covenant, right? We spent a long time talking about that in Hebrews. Everything I'm going to read to you comes out of the New Testament. And I want you to consider to yourself whether or not these are teachings that you are interested in and willing to follow. <clears throat> Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. Now Jesus says this. This is one of the only passages right now that I'm going to read you where what is said is attributed to Christ. This comes out of John. I think it's chapter, let me get the chapter right. Yeah, John chapter 20. 
and it, this was our lectionary reading for this past week, so you've probably already heard it. If you want to look these up because you don't believe me, it's John chapter 20, verse 21. Jesus said to them, he's appearing to them after the resurrection. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. Now, this is likely to, to really bother you because you are not in a Roman Catholic church. So when I talk about how we do backflips sometimes to justify what we want to believe, that is eisegesis. That is when I approach the text with a predefined belief, a pre, let me say a pre-selected belief, and I read the text in a way that causes the text to support my belief. In the United Methodist Church, do we believe that you have to go to a priest to be forgiven? Jesus said to them, is Jesus a liar? Affirm to me that we should not follow what Jesus taught. That's the conundrum I'm going to put before you. Jesus said to them, again, peace be with you, shalom, that's a greeting. As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. I'm going to send you out, just as the Father sent me out. Who is he talking to? He's talking to the apostles specifically to the apostles. Somebody tell me what, what apostolic succession is. I'm about to make you really mad. Somebody tell me what apostolic succession is. Back through to the apostles, through Peter and to Christ. Jesus said to Peter that you are the rock, and on this rock I will build my church, right? So here Jesus is appearing to the, the apostles, and he's giving them direction. You know where I'm going with this, right? He's, he's appeared to the apostles, and he's giving them direction, right? Does he say, I'm giving this direction to every single person who will ever believe in or follow me? No. He says, I'm giving this to the apostles. As another generation arises, what must the apostles do? They must figure out who will succeed them. That process is a process that we today call ordination. When does the first ordination in the Bible occur? Happens in the book of Acts. There is a dispute that arises. Um, there, are, there's a, there's a, there are two different groups of Jewish people, and they get angry with each other about how food is being distributed. And so they come to the apostles. You know what the apostles say? This would not fly in any church in America today. Great big survey that was conducted, there were actually two really good ones, but there was a great big survey that was conducted and the results of it were, were released like last year. And it said this, look it up on Google. Whole groups of people, like thousands of people were surveyed to find out what they believe the most important mission of the church is. Now, this is off the top of my head, so the percentage will be wrong, but it was like 75 or 80%, you know, maybe 85% of respondents said, guess what, what did you think? that 75 to 85% of the respondents said the primary mission of the church is. <clears throat> you would think it'd be like the Great Commission to bring people to Christ. That was not it. That's what I would have said too, but that was not it. Take care of me until I die. 75 to 85% of respondents said the primary mission of the church is to take care of me. The apostles are confronted by a group of people who are having this argument. Yeah, it blows your mind, right? They're, they're confronted by this group of people because there's this argument. Anytime you put people together in any capacity, we just tend to not agree about things. That's just the nature of humanity. So they're arguing about uh, food distribution. You know what the apostles say? <clears throat> they say, we need to appoint some good people to take care of this because this is not as important as spreading the gospel. We are going to, and I'm paraphrasing, we are going to spend our time spreading the gospel, so let's ordain, or they say appoint, some good people who can manage all of this chaos and fuss that's happening with the distribution of food. Um, that's the first example. Uh, scholars and theologians all agree that is the first example of ordination in the Bible. So apostolic succession happens because as, hu as humanity continues to, to live and grow past the first generation of Christ followers, they must appoint those to succeed them who will carry the teachings, who will carry the authority given by Christ to Peter. Everything I'm telling you, we don't like. 
because we are not Roman Catholic. The, the very, this very issue I am about to bring up to you is one of the issues that, although we are not Protestants, Protestants and those churches that don't like the Roman Catholic Church have a big issue with this. So what do we do? We do backflips to reinterpret this in a way that fits more, it's more in line with what we think. So Jesus is talking right here to whom? The apostles. So Jesus said to them, Peace be with you, shalom. As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. So I was sent, and now this will be your mission. You will be sent. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit, the breath of life. You've heard that, uh, that that is called Ruach Elohim in Hebrew, the breath of God. This is the part that we have a problem with. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they are not forgiven. And then he stops, and he goes on to the episode with Thomas, whom we call Doubting Thomas. So what does that mean? Who is he talking to? The apostles. What does he first do? Well, first he commissions them, commissions them to mission, right? As God sent me, so now I am sending you. So you're going to be sent. Your mission will be the mission I had. Same mission, right? Then he gives them authority. What does he give them authority to do? He gives them two different kinds of authority. Not only... Does he give them the authority to forgive? What, does he, what else does he give them the authority to do? To retain, to not forgive. Jesus says to the, and we don't like this. This bothers us. Why? Because who, can, who forgives sins? God forgives our sin. Only God can forgive, except that God said what? Yeah. God said the apostles have this authority. On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This church is succeeded by those whom, who are ordained to succeed it. So strictly speaking, if we are going to be a people who do what the Bible says, what does that mean? Doctrinally, we did some backflips to justify something that we didn't agree with. That is called eisegesis. Is that a clear scripture? That depends on whether or not you want it to be a clear scripture. If I don't want a priesthood to have the authority to either forgive. So there's two issues here, right? And one of them is that the authority is given to the apostles and then transmuted through apostolic succession. That's one issue, right? The other issue is that we don't really like the idea that, I mean, it, maybe it's okay that God gives somebody the authority to forgive, but God also gave them the authority not to forgive and said, if you don't forgive, they're not forgiven. So that bothers me, right? That, that's just bothersome. I mean, that doesn't actually bother me, but that, that's bothersome, isn't it? Or is it? Let's talk about some other, some other instances. It kind of does. Um, let me make you even more upset. We haven't even got there yet. Has... Uh, have the rules ever changed? If God tells us that we're not supposed to do something, is there any precedent for that changing to where we can now do something that previously we couldn't do? At noon on the following day, as their journey brought them close to the city, Peter, who's Peter? He went up to the roof to pray. He became hungry and he wanted to eat. What story is this? Peter went up to the roof to, to the pray. He became hungry and he wanted to eat. While others were preparing the meal, he had a visionary experience. He saw heaven opened up and something like a large linen sheet being lowered to the earth by its four corners. Inside the sheet were all kinds of four-legged animals, reptiles and wild birds. And a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter explained, absolutely not, Lord. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. Why is that an issue? What do the rules of his Hebrew faith say? Can't eat anything that's unclean. Peter said, absolutely not. Who does he say that to? God. God has given him the command, and it's always Peter. Peter's like, no, God, you're wrong. And God's like, no, Peter, I'm not wrong. The voice spoke a second time, never consider unclean what God has made pure. That, I think, is one of the most powerful statements in the entirety of Scripture. When you have trouble, this is totally off topic, but when you have trouble accepting the forgiveness that God offers you, I want you to go back and read this verse. 
we do not have the authority to call unclean what God has made clean. That means that when you've been forgiven, God has made you clean. Never, call, never consider unclean what God has made pure. This happened three times. Then the object was suddenly pulled back into heaven. Peter was bewildered about the meaning of the vision. Just then the messengers sent by Cornelius delivered the whereabouts of Simon's house and arrived at the gate. Calling out, they inquired whether Simon, known as Peter, was a guest there. While Peter was brooding over the vision, the spirit interrupted him. Look, there are people looking for you. Go downstairs. Don't ask questions. Just go with them because I've sent them. What is this in preparation for? Peter's about to go somewhere. Do you remember where he's going to go? He's going to go to the homes of some non-believers, some Gentiles. And he's going to share with them the word of God. He's going to share with them the good news. What happens to them as Peter is sharing this? Now, these are Gentile people. They are filled with the Holy Spirit. And it happens prior to something that sometimes people thought it couldn't happen prior to. What does it happen prior to? Baptism. They are filled with the Holy Spirit by God before they're baptized. And Peter actually, he witnesses this and he says, well, if God filled them with the Holy Spirit, then I guess I should probably baptize them, right? Um, so I ask you again, is there an instance in which the rules changed? Scripturally, is there a precedent for that? <clears throat> All right, I'm not done making you mad yet. This one, this one is... Because this one makes everybody mad. Um, sometimes when I teach on this, I make sure there is an exit nearby. <coughs> this is in first, I've got two. This is in first Timothy two. Okay? Now who writes first Timothy? Who's the author of that letter? That's Paul. Paul who is writing to Timothy. Okay? Timothy is like a young, he'd be the equivalent of a young minister. He's a young leader in the Christian movement who's being mentored by Paul. Therefore, I want men to pray everywhere by lifting up hands that are holy without anger or argument. I cannot tell you the number of times that I have listened to someone, um, and not every person is like this. We all have our faults. I have plenty of them. But I can't tell you the number of times <coughs> I've listened to someone who is passionately and vehemently defending how someone else is failing to uphold the scriptural standard. And as I'm listening to this, uh, I'm listening to this being argued passionately by a person wearing jewelry. In the same way, <clears throat> I want women to enhance their appearance with clothing that is modest and sensible not with elaborate hairstyles, gold, pearls, or expensive clothes. My mother was walking home from church one night in a small town of Hiawatha, Kansas, where she grew up. There is a, a there's like any other town, there are multiple denominations present in that place, and she passed some people who were coming from another kind of church. It was a family, and the man, who's obviously the husband and father, uh, proceeded to berate my mother, who was probably 13 or 14 years old, because she was wearing makeup and jewelry, and the scriptures say that you're not to do that. In the same way, I want women to enhance their appearance with clothing that is modest and sensible, not with elaborate hairstyles, gold, pearls, or expensive clothes. What do you think that experience did to my mom? She remembers it, and there's a reason she does. They should make themselves attractive by doing good. This isn't even the bad part yet. They should make themselves attracted by doing good, which is appropriate for women who claim to honor God. So by implication, what is, what is Paul saying here? You are a brave person. I usually wait for the women to answer that question. What is it that Paul is saying here? If you want to honor God, you must not do what? No jewelry, no make. So by implication, if you're doing those things... This is, this is the part that will make you mad if you're not mad yet. A wife should learn quietly with complete submission. I, d <laughs> I don't allow a wife to teach or to control her husband. Instead, she should be quiet. Why? That's what you're thinking right now. 
because Adam was formed first and then Eve, and Adam wasn't deceived. It's like Paul was never a dude, you know? Adam wasn't deceived, but rather his wife became the, I can just see Paul is, you know, this is a letter to Timothy, and Timothy's reading this, right? And he's like, I am not preaching this on Sunday. There's no way I am preaching this on Sunday. Because I can see every guy who just shrink in the congregation while this, Adam was formed first and then Eve. Adam wasn't deceived, but rather his wife became the one who stepped over the line because she was completely deceived. But, don't worry, because a woman will be kept safe through childbirth, provided that she continues in faith and love and holiness combined with self-control. So I ask you, do you even want to continue the study? <laughs> All right. Why are we talking about this? Let me get us back to Romans. Give me just a second. These things are fantastic, but I don't navigate them very quickly. Um, why are we talking about this? Because one of the things that I want to point out is that each of us interprets the Scripture. The minute we try to take Scripture and turn it, especially the New Testament, which is a what kind of covenant? Relational. The minute we take a relational covenant and try to make it legalistic, what will we do? We will scour the Scriptures to try to find the passages we can pull out to use as law. Now, what does that mean? It means that you have to be careful. Because whatever the hot button topic is for you, whatever it is that you really don't like that other people do, that why am I talking about this? Because for our culture, homosexuality is the hot button topic. We are about to, to find out if our whole denomination is going to split in two. There's a special general conference that's been called in 2019 so that we can deal with this topic. That's, this is the hot button issue of our time. There was a time when the hot button issue was slavery, and there was a time when the hot button issue was women's suffrage, and there was a time when the hot button issue was temperance. Um, for the church, women's ordination. So I just read to you this passage from Timothy about women learning in silence with full submission, right? Um, so John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, he was an Anglican priest, and he he really grew that movement through the use of lay preachers. That's why we still have lay speakers. We're having a lay speaking training session here in the church this weekend. Um, so what does that mean? They were traveling itinerant lay preachers who went around to homes and to assemblies all over the British Isles and the American frontier, and they preached and they taught and they converted. There was this big issue about whether or not they could baptize. Uh, there's a guy named Robert Strawbridge who was a lay speaker, Irish lay speaker in the northeastern United States. He was told he couldn't baptize, and he wrote back and said, all the, all the Anglican priests went back to Britain during the, Civil, the Revolutionary War. There's nobody here to baptize. And, they, and Wesley was mad at him. Wesley was like, well, you can't do it. And Strawbridge was like, I don't care. You're on the other side of the ocean. So Strawbridge started baptizing people, right? The first Methodist conference excommunicated him. He's a first Methodist ever to be excommunicated. By, he might be one of the only Methodists ever. The next general conference reinstated him. And then the next general conference punished him because there were also stories about him doing forced baptisms of people. So, um, <clears throat> lay speaking. Wesley used women as lay speakers, as lay preachers, back in the 1700s. He was approached one day, his journal writes about this, by a well-meaning Christian man who said, have you not read Timothy? Let me read to you what Timothy says. You know what John Wesley said? He said, I've, I've, I'm a graduate of Oxford University. I know what the Bible says. But who am I to deny what God is doing through these women? Who am I to deny the fruit that God is producing in their ministry? What was this guy wanting him to do? As clergy, we often find that people really want us to stand up for what they believe in. They want us to rail against whatever they think is wrong. This man approached Wesley wanting him to do that. Here's what I believe the Bible says, priest. I want you to support what I believe. And what did Wesley do? Wesley said, I'm, the one, I'm not the one who decides that. God is. I know what the Bible says, and I also know what God is doing in her. Is there ever any instance in the history of ever where God does the opposite of what we thought God said was supposed to happen? Yeah. So whose failure of understanding is it? Probably ours. 
from Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus. Why am I telling you all this? Because homosexuality is a hot-button topic. Friends, the argument, the debate is what's evil. I don't really, I could not really care less which side of that debate you happen to fall on. Um, not, often I am asked to teach about it because people want to know whether or not I agree with them. Um, does Paul believe that homosexuality is wrong? Well, if you read the chapter one for today, I mean, that's fairly clear. Does, uh, and, and he'll bring it up again. He brings it up in other letters that he writes. I believe it comes up in 1 Corinthians as well, if I'm not mistaken. Um, does it come up in the Old Testament? Sure it does. Um, sure. And so here you have this Jewish guy who I brought up to you before who wanted to do a year of biblical living. Do you remember this story? What does the Old Testament say that a woman is supposed to do during the time of the month that we're not really supposed to talk about in public? She has to leave the community. How many of you leave the community during that time of the month? Do you know what else it says? It says that if you sit down on a chair during that time of the month, I'm not supposed to sit in the same spot because I'll be unclean. Did Christ ever touch, allow himself to be touched by or dine with people who made him unclean. Give me a couple of examples. Lepers. There's a woman who's been bleeding for how many years? It's like 12 years or something like that. What kind of bleeding is the Bible talking about? Same kind of bleeding we're talking about. She reaches out and touches Jesus' garment, and Jesus says, I, I, who touched me? I felt power go out of me. The people around him get angry. Why? Because by touching him, their laws, their laws given to Moses by, say that a man specifically, a scribe or a teacher of the law um, or part of the, the priesthood, they will be made unclean if they are touched by a woman who is bleeding in that way. And so all these people who know the law so well are really angry about this. And yet who is it that's being touched by this woman? the same God who gave them the law. And he turns around. Does he get mad at the woman for touching him? What happens? She's healed. Does this God ever allow himself to be around people who are unclean? Zacchaeus was one of my favorite stories. I think I'm actually preaching about Zacchaeus on Sunday. <coughs> Excuse me, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, right? Remember that song? Um, climbed up in a sycamore tree because the Lord he wanted to see, and Jesus passed his way. What was Zacchaeus? He was a tax collector, right? I need to apologize in advance in case there is anybody from the IRS watching this, but is there anybody more unclean than the IRS in our culture? <laughs> Probably is, yeah. <clears throat> so he goes to eat with a tax collector and a sinner. They always, the scriptures over and over, I think this is horrid, say tax collectors and sinners. Like there's all, everybody who's a sinner, but then there's tax collectors who are even worse. They're so bad they get their own category, right? So Jesus is eating with tax collectors and sinners. Who is Jesus? Jesus is God doing the opposite of what we thought was supposed to be the case, or maybe he's just changing it. <clears throat> um, I can tell you without a doubt that I think the way that we're handling the entirety of this debate about homosexuality is not of God. From Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for God's good news. God promised this good news about his son ahead of time through his prophets and in the Holy Scriptures. His son was descended from David. He was publicly identified as God's son with power through his resurrection from the dead, which was based on the spirit of holiness. This son is Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we have received God's grace and our appointment to be apostles. Appointment. Do you get that? We have received our appointment. That is apostolic succession. This was to bring all Gentiles to faithful obedience for his namesake, you who are called by Jesus Christ are also included among these Gentiles. To those in Rome who are dearly loved by God and called to, God's, to be God's people, grace 
and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. This is still part of the, the traditional Greek salutation. Because the news about your faithfulness is being spread throughout the whole world, I serve God in my spirit by preaching the good news about God's Son, and God is my witness that I continually mention you. In all my prayers, I'm always asking that somehow, by God's will, I might succeed in visiting you at last. He really wanted to go to Rome. Paul just, he really wanted to go to Rome, and eventually he gets there. I really want to see you to pass along some spiritual gift to you so that you can be strengthened. What I mean is that we can mutually encourage each other while I'm with you. We can be encouraged by the faithfulness we find in each other, both your faithfulness and mine. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that I plan to visit you many times, although I've been prevented from coming until now. I want to harvest some fruit among you, just as I've done among the other Gentiles. I have a responsibility both to Greeks and to those who don't speak Greek, <clears throat> to the wise and to the foolish. That's why this is where the theology begins. That's why I'm ready to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, and you shouldn't be. Um, we sometimes are ashamed of the gospel. We shouldn't be, because it is good news. Part of the problem <clears throat> with the way we've communicated the gospel is that instead of communicating to people that there is a God who loves them for generations, we've tried to communicate to people that there is a God who can save them from hell. So if you're not a Christian and you don't believe in any of this, in order to convince you that there is a God who will save you from hell, what do I first have to convince you of before I can even do that? A, there is a hell, and B, you're going there. So if I'm not a Christian, what you're trying to communicate to me as good news is not good news, it's awful news. What you just told me is that I'm a terrible person and I'm going to hell. But don't worry, because God can save you, right? Um, in Acts, Paul gives this great speech about how Christians are not supposed to be the moral police of the Gentile world. We are supposed to hold one another accountable. But with those who are not amongst our number, we're supposed to communicate to them the good news of Jesus Christ, which is that there is a God who has overcome sin and death, that God is real, and that God loves you and wants to bring you into relationship with who that God is. There's never been a single person in the history of the world who has saved anybody. God does that. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's God's own power for salvation to all who have faith in God, to, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. God's righteousness is being revealed in the gospel from faithfulness. For faith, as is written, the, right, the righteous person will live by that, will live by faith. Um, God's wrath is being revealed from heaven against all the ungodly behavior and the injustice of human beings who silence the truth with injustice. Why is homosexuality the hot button topic of our day? Why is that? Does what you believe about that affect one single iota about how you choose to live your life? Maybe it affects how you treat people. Why is it the hot-button topic of our day? For us, what you believe about homosexuality defines you as either a what or a what. It defines you as either a... Which side am I on here? For you, this would be the left, right? So it defines you as either a liberal or a conservative. Is that right? Or hip okay, could define you as a hypocrite. <laughs> because of, okay, fair enough. <clears throat> um, so it, uh, for us, really what we're wanting to know is, are you a liberal or are you conservative? Why? Because we are more divided as a, as a country than we have been in a very long time. And I want to know, proverbially speaking, what side of that fence you fall on, right? I uh, heard somebody say recently that there was a time when we identified ourselves by something other than whom we voted for in the last election. 
So what if there is another option for you? What if that option is not as idealistic and ridiculous as it sounds? What if that other option for you is not as cliche as it sounds? What if Jesus, who said that we are supposed to be in the world but not of the world, meant what he said? So instead of trying to decide whether or not you are a... Everybody who is watching this online is going to be looking to see who's sitting over here and who's sitting over here. What if there's something more than whether you are a liberal or, or you are a conservative? What if what Christ is really calling you to identify with? Maybe another way to say that is whom Christ is calling you to identify with is him. <clears throat> Jesus said that it would be a really good idea if you removed the what before the what. Jesus said you really ought to consider removing the plank out of your own eye before you worry about the speck of sawdust in somebody else's eye. We have developed this culture where we want to make sure that everybody else does whatever we think is right. So if I think that homosexuality is wrong, then darn, you darn well better believe that or we can't be in relationship of any kind and you're an evil person. If I think that homosexuality is right, then you have no right to think that it's wrong. And we can't be friends because you're demeaning and derogatory. That is ridiculous. It is one of the most ridiculous things that American culture has ever done, especially considering that we follow a God, <coughs> excuse me, we follow a God who has given us a great understanding about how it is that the world is supposed to know that we are his followers. How is it that he said the world will know that we are followers of Christ? They'll know that we are Christians by, you know that. Did he say that they'll know that we are Christians by the way that you take a stand for the left or the way that you take a stand for the right? No, come on. Jesus said, they'll know that we are Christians by our love. Where do we, you've heard me say this now a hundred times, where do we receive that love from? That love comes from God. What does it do? It transforms us. What does it transform us into? It transforms us into the image of God. If you want to know what is right to do, whom is it that you are supposed to ask that question? God. The same God who said, now get up and sin no more. The same God who right before he said, now get up and sin no more, stepped in front of the woman who was about to be stoned for adultery so that that wouldn't happen to her. The same God through, who through Moses originally gave the law that said that she was supposed to be stoned for adultery and then he stopped it from happening and gave her the kind of grace that we've come to demand for ourselves but reject for other people. And then he said, get up and sin no more. That's the God we follow. We follow the same God who took people and said, what you're doing is wrong, stop doing it and let all of the people that were supposed to be unclean touch him. Our God seems like he is an oxymoron. He seems like he, he is always contradicting himself. The issue there is that we don't know enough to understand why God does what God does. What we know is that what God does is right, and that's why we follow him instead of expecting him to follow us. So what does that mean about how you are supposed to feel about homosexuality. Are you supposed to believe that it's right? Are you supposed to believe that it's wrong? Yeah. You're going to ask that question right before I get to the answer. Yeah. Majority rule. Yeah. Which we've talked about before, right? Sure. Right. 
So let me ask you this. Is not agreeing about God's will an excuse for not doing it or seeking it? Is not agreeing about what God's will is a good excuse for not seeking it? Right, right. And then I have to vote. Right. Yes. Say, say that last part again. Okay. Um, yeah, the examples you've given are fairly extreme, well, and that makes them obvious. But what um, Paul actually said about that was in the context of food, because that was their hot-button topic for the day. Can you eat food that's been sacrificed to idols? Can you eat things that are unclean? So Paul's answer to that was this. He said, let the people who think that they're honoring God by eating the food eat the food because they're doing it out of an attempt to honor God. And the people who, re who refrain from it, let them refrain from it because they're doing that because they think they're doing it as a means by which they can honor God, which flies in stark contrast to our we need to make sure that everybody does exactly the same thing mentality. Well, oh, sure. They would, and that's why it's, sure, and that's why it's a hot-button topic for us, sure. The, the reason that people, f because people feel so strongly about it, um, that is what makes it a hot-button topic. Now, you can make the case that, sure, we need to make decisions as a group. Um, we need to decide what we will and will not allow. My question to you is, what what is it that we will then be judged for? My concern is not that we are disagreeing about what God's will is. My concern is that I don't think we're seeking it. And that's a totally different issue. Now you can theoretically say, well, maybe everybody is seeking it. Um, I think that the number of people in the church who don't have a very good understanding about what it means to know God or hear God means that it, if that if that is the case, then how am I to expect that those folks who don't know very well how to hear God are hearing God about this? And so then I wonder, when I stand before God, will God say, why did you make a decision about this without hearing what I wanted you to do? And I think that's a valid criticism. I don't think saying that we have to make a decision and people disagree is an excuse for not seeking God's will. And so the question is, what do we do? Well, the answer to that question is that people who are going to be homosexual are going to be homosexual whether we tell them that it's okay or not. So really what the church in this context is trying to decide is whether or not we'll sanction it. It stands to reason that, and this is where, this is where you will have issues with what I am saying. I don't think it's wise for us to take an action that relies upon discerning God's will until we can discern God's will. Yeah, you can't just not ever do anything, right? We are talking about judgment.
Yeah, you're talking about the difference between absolutism and relativism. That is the question. And if that is the case, if someone who is engaged in sin is not, and that's what we're talking about, of whether or not this is going to be a, a sin, if somebody who is engaged in something that we define as sin is not, does not have access to the love and grace of God, then explain to me, please, the entirety of Scripture, because I've got the whole thing wrong. I thought that was who God extended that to. But that also means that we're in trouble, Right? Remember that question my dad likes to ask, which is, who is sinning right now? And everybody, because we don't want to be self-righteous, we're all like, oh, I'm a sinner, because we've been taught you know, that we're all sinners. We're all sinning in some way. And then he looks back at us and says, stop, as loud as he can. And then he says, now who's sinning? So is it a hot-button topic? Yeah, and it's a hot-button topic for as much for cultural reasons, maybe more so for cultural reasons than even theological reasons. So let's talk about the difference in making the decision um, within denominations that believe different things. Since we're talking about the Catholics and the Methodists, let's use those two. Jesus said, um, Jesus came to them and said, peace be with you. As I was sent, so you will be sent. If you forgive them anything, it is forgiven them. And if you don't forgive them, they are not forgiven, right? So in a church like the Roman Catholic Church, who's going to make the decision about whether or not something like that is a sin? Ultimately, the, the Pope would, but let's say the clergy. The clergy would make that decision. Why? Um, large part of that justification is going to come out of that verse that I just read to you. The idea being that those who are ordained to that know God well enough to hear what God is wanting to do. Now, you can make a case that... They don't know God well enough. Just because they're ordained doesn't mean that they know God, right? So what is our answer to that? Um, what does democracy mean? Do you know what that means? What does the word democracy mean? Rule by the what? Rule by the mob. Democracy means rule by the mob. Now, I'm not advocating that we take another form of polity. But the, our alternative to that was everybody's going to vote. Now, that's good because it affirms everybody's unique worth, Right? But if our task is to discern what God's will is, why do we disagree? Well, if God has a will, and I think that God's will is this, and you think God's will is that, what does that mean? One of us is wrong, right? <clears throat> At least one. Maybe both of us are wrong, right? Because there aren't just always two options here. So what does that mean for us? Well, if everybody's going to vote on it, then that means that, logically speaking, there are probably at least a portion of us voting who don't know how to hear God, right? So we're voting on something, trying to discern whether or not it's God's will without having any idea whether or not those of us who are voting are able to hear God, which makes that problematic. So what is our response to that? Do it anyway, because we have to. We have to make a decision. So what do we do? We do it anyway. How has, how's that working out for us? Answer that question for me. What are we experiencing in the United States right now about this issue and the other divisive topics or even in our church? Yep. Yep. So what I'm sharing is idealistic. Why? I mean, is it out of the realm of possibility that seem unrealistic that a minister would stand before you and say before we do something like this we ought to have an idea about what it is that God wants us to do come on that's idealistic it's not practical if practical were working out any better I might advocate for it maybe as followers of Christ we are supposed to believe that God can do what God has said that God will do which means that maybe as a people, we need to be a little more patient in waiting for the answers until we know the God who gives the answers well enough to hear his voice. So what does that mean that we do? 
Because while I'm waiting for that God, to, while I'm waiting to be able to hear that God, do I not have to still make decisions about how to live my life day in and day out? I do, right? I still have to make decisions all day, every day about what I'm going to do and who I'm going to be. Excuse me. <coughs> um, so what do I do? I throw that question back at you because I think you know the answer. I seek. The process by which we confirm what God wants us to do is, is what? what? Where do we go to confirm what God is wanting us to do? Prayer, individual prayer, which is where we communicate with God. Before I can hear God, I'm lifting up prayers of petition. Is God capable of communicating to me even before I know how to hear God's voice, metaphorically speaking? Of course God is capable of that. Individual prayer, what else? Community of faith scriptures, and our mentor. If you have not identified for yourself somebody that you do believe hears God very well to serve as your mentor, you are cutting yourself short. You're making it harder for yourself to grow. So when I'm struggling with what I should do in a circumstance like this, guess who I will go talk to to confirm what I believe that I'm hearing? I will go talk to the person that I believe hears God well. Now, as Robert's pointed out in a couple of our our gatherings, it's possible that I th think that you're hearing God and you're actually not, right? Is, isn't that possible? Okay. Um, this is going to be really hard to wrap your mind around, if you, especially if you're still learning what it means to hear God. Um, the reason that seems difficult is because of our lack of collective experience with God. The only way I can explain that is by using a metaphor, and every metaphor is woefully inadequate, okay? But let me try to use one anyway. I've used this before, let me use it again. If I know Kate, now there is a possibility that, I'm, that I am schizophrenic, and I don't mean that jokingly, but let's assume that I'm not schizophrenic. If I know Kate, how do I know that I know Kate? How do I know? I mean, how do I know that I know Kate? Okay. One of my favorite areas of, of study, if I had gone overseas to Britain to work on a PhD, I would have studied epistemology, which is how we know what we know, or how we think we know what we know. Everything we just said is great, but it, but it doesn't answer my question. So I can I can I know that I know Kate because of communication. How do I know she's actually talking to me and it's not just a figment of my imagination? How do I know Kate? How do I know that I know Kate? Okay. So my because because of all my experiences. So let me take you down this road a little bit. Because my experience of reality, which is my perception of reality, my experience of reality has given me tools uh, where, that I use to judge the reality of my experience. Did you follow me? My experience of reality has given me tools that I use to judge the reality of my experience. Okay? Have you ever um, had one of those dreams that seems incredibly real and you wake up for a minute and, and you think it's real and then you realize that it's not real? Okay. Um, how do we know that that's not real? Because our experience of reality has given us tools to judge the reality of our experience. For a minute I was fooled, but then my, my, the experience I've had of reality helped me to understand that that dream wasn't real, right? So how do I know that Kate is real? I choose to believe that Kate is real because of my experience of reality. Are you following me? My experience of reality is that it is possible to know a person that there are people in the world who exist other than myself and that I can communicate with them, right? So if I happen to, if I met Kate on the street today and never met her before, would I question whether or not she's a real person? Probably not. Would I question whether or not she's actually speaking to me? I mean, and I understand, and I don't mean this disparagingly, that there are mental health issues that affect that. 
Um, so when I talk about this, I, I want us to understand that we're assuming that we don't have those mental health issues. Those, those are real, and the people who struggle with those have a very real struggle, and I don't want to belittle that even by joking about it. But assuming that that is not the case, then why do I, how do I know that I know Kate? Because my experience of reality has given me tools by which I judge the reality of my experience. Are you following me? What happens when my reality changes? Has that ever happened to humanity before? That our reality has changed? There was a time, I've been watching this pirate show lately, there was this time w when you would have gotten on a boat and sailed where if you kept going? Right at the edge of the world, right? Everybody knew that was true. That was reality. Everybody knew that, right? They also knew that there were mermaids, and they also knew that there were great leviathans that would come up from out of the deep and destroy you, okay? What happened when, when we save, sailed around the world? Our experience of reality changed, which gave us a different set of tools by which to judge the reality of our experience. So how do I know that I know God? Because when God helps you to understand how to communicate with God, your experience of reality changes. Let me extend this metaphor. Let's say I had, per proverbially, I'd grown up on, on the uh, island in the middle of nowhere, right? Never been around another person ever. Um, is it Plato's, I think it's Plato's analogy of the cave, that if I live my life chained up in a cave and all I s have, the only interaction I have with people is based on the shadows that they produce on, on the wall, then what happens when I interact with people for the first time? If I've grown up on an island, how did I get on the island? I have no idea how I got on the island, but I got on the island and I grew up, somehow I survived and I'm an adult and I've never encountered a person before. And then Kate shows up on that island. My experience of reality changes because I've just had an experience of something that I didn't know was possible, that I'd never experienced and I had no frame of reference for, but yet Kate is right there. So what do I do? Well, at first I may question whether or not it's real. Do you see how this metaphor works out with understanding God and communicating with him? At first I may question whether or not it's real, but the more I interact with Kate, the more I'm going to be certain of one of two things. Either I have gone crazy because I've been on this island alone my whole life, or she's actually real. Does that make sense? My experience of reality changes, and that gives me new tools by which to judge the reality of my experience. As my experience of understanding communication with God changes, and it's God who, awaken, who awakens what Wesley called the spiritual senses to allow that to happen, as that changes, my experience of reality changes. What I previously didn't know was possible, I now understand it is possible, not just theoretically, but by experience. Now, here I am, and I'm on, now this is going to be a metaphor that's super hard to grasp, okay? But I'm alone on my island. And there's another person who's alone on another island, right? And we can't communicate with each other. So this person who's alone on this other island has grown up the same way I am, or I've grown up, right? And let's say, even though this is a terrible metaphor, that maybe I can communicate with that person. I'm like, listen, I just found out there's another person in the world, right? And they'd be like, that's ridiculous. You're just stupid and crazy. You just think you're seeing this person. You're not actually seeing this person. So how do I prove to you that Kate is real? How do I prove to you that Kate is real if I cannot take Kate and plop her down on your island? Or better yet, how do I prove to you that Kate is real when I tell you that Kate is real and you're on your own island and you think I'm stupid, so you close your eyes and plug your ears and hum a tune so that you won't hear anything, and so even though I'm standing there with Kate, you're not looking and you're not listening, how do I prove to you that Kate is real? And so you say to me, well, it's possible, Matt, that you think you're talking to Kate, but maybe somebody else thinks they're talking to Kate too, and they're actually not. What do I say to that? Do I know that I'm talking to Kate? Yes. And if Kate has told me something, and then Phil shows up on his boat, because Phil grew up on another island, and Phil grow shows up on his boat, and Phil comes to me, and Phil's like, oh, no, no, Kate told me this. And that's the opposite of what Kate told you. What do you think I'm going to do? I'm going to look at Kate, and I'm going to be like, Kate, did you say that? And Kate's either going to say, yeah, I did. And then I'm going to be like, why, why did you tell him one thing and me another thing? That's super confusing. Do you see where this is going? 
So if you tell me that God tells you something, then uh, something that is different than what God told me, the only argument you have at this point to make is that I'm crazy. Now that's possible. It's possible that I'm crazy. And so I would ask you who know me without using a metaphor to judge from the rest of my life, my actions and my behavior, whether or not you think I'm crazy. Your experience of reality changes, and that gives you new tools by which to judge the reality of your experience. If Phil shows up and says, oh no, Kate told me this, and I look at Kate, who's right here, and I'm like, Kate, did you say that? And Phil's like not communicating with Kate, and that's pretty obvious to me. Why? Because Kate's right there. And so I'm like, Kate, did you say that? And Kate's like, no, I didn't say that. I'm still working in Phil to help him to understand how to talk to me. Why? Because we don't serve a God who sits up on his throne and points down at us and laughs while we're trying to figure out how to do this. We serve a God who wants to know us. So how do we make decisions? First way I make decisions is by making it a priority to get to know God. You start beginning of Genesis 1, and you will find that that is the reason God made you. God made you to have fellowship with God. You're not here for any other reason. You're not here to pay your taxes. You're not here to get a great job. You're not here to change the world. You are here to have fellowship with God. Now, does that mean God's not going to tell you, tell you that you shouldn't pay your taxes? No, I just read that passage this morning in my devotion, which was really, I mean, probably good that it didn't come up two weeks ago because that's not my favorite passage in the Bible. Does that mean that God's not going to call you to change the world? No, it means your purpose on earth is to know God. So if you've made anything else a higher priority than that, change it now. Because until you know God, you're going to have a hard time asking God and hearing from God what it is that God wants you to do. So the answer to the homosexuality question is you're darn right idealistic. Somebody once told me in a leadership class that people are going to ridicule you no matter what you do. No matter what decision you make or action you take, people will ridicule you for it. So do what you believe is right so that when they ridicule you, you can say, yeah, that's what I did and here's why I did it. Is it idealistic to say we should check in with God before we make decisions about whether or not to sanction homosexuality? Of course it is. And it's also the right thing to do, so you can darn well better believe that that's what I'm going to do, and it's what I'm going to teach. So what is my concern? This is, this is, Paul at one point says, this is coming from God, and this is coming from me. This is coming from me. This is my concern with the church. My concern with the church is that if, if there are so many of us who don't yet know what it is to hear God's voice, um, every time I, I teach a class on how to hear God, I spend 60 to 70% of that class, con class time convincing people that it's possible to do. If there are that many of us who don't yet know how to do that, then yeah, you're darn right I'm concerned about taking a large vote about what to do based on a whole bunch of us who aren't hearing God's will. That's why I think the debate has gone off track about this. I think that if we serve a God who, on the one hand, steps in front of a woman who's about to be stoned based on the law and then turns around to her and says, get up and sin no more, if we serve a God who's walking down the street and is touched by a woman who's unclean and spends time with sinners and tax collectors, I think if that's the God that we follow, then we had darn well better check in with that God about what that God wants us to sanction and what that God doesn't want us to sanction and how that God wants us to interact with people in each and every circumstance in life. Because I'm not entirely sure that there is a one-size-fits-all answer to this question, and that's what we want. We want a one-size-fits-all answer. Yes, it's fine. No, it's not. And I think God may be saying something different. And I think that we have a hard time wrapping our minds around what that could be because we have segregated ourselves into believing that this is so black and white. I halfway wonder, because I think that with the United Methodist Church in particular, this um, debate has the potential to split the church. Now, I don't think that the end result of that it will be two denominations. I think the end result of that will be fractured, a fractured denomination 
where a number of churches end up closing and or struggling to survive. Let me tell you how this works out. Right now, there are people, there are people in this room who fall on one side of that fence or another. So imagine that we bring the whole church in. And the denomination says, okay, there's two denominations now. One of them thinks homosexuality is all right. The other one thinks homosexuality is not all right. You've got to choose as a church which side you're going to go on. There are people in this congregation every Sunday morning who believe one or the other of those things. Why do you think it is that we coexist in the midst of those different belief systems? Because we don't talk about it. That's true. We coexist in the midst of that because we don't talk about it. So what happens when we stop ignoring it? What if we vote in a way that you believe is wrong? Then you leave. What happens when you leave from a practical perspective? Do you keep giving after you leave? What? That's right. And so you have churches all over the country that are barely keeping their doors open. What happens when 30 or 40 or 50 or 60% of the congregation leave? Probably wouldn't be the case, right? Because 50% or more would vote one way, so you're probably going to have up to 45 or 48% leave. What happens to that church? So the ultimate end of this debate is the closure of churches. That makes me wonder whose will it is that we're doing in the midst of the debate. At the beginning of this conversation, I told you that I think the debate is evil. Why? Because I don't think it's God's will that we end up closing the church. But I also, this is my perspective, I wonder that we're even trying to seek his will. Next time you have the chance to talk about this, and we don't talk about it in America, when we had our French foreign exchange student staying with us, it's part of their ethic that they talk about controversial topics, right? They just think that's normal. We don't. We're like, there are certain things we are not going to talk about, right? So you're probably not going to talk about this with anybody outside of your immediate family, right? The next time you do have an opportunity to do that, ask the person that you're discussing this with what God has told them about it. And I bet in that moment, you'll, you'll have an opportunity to discern whether or not they've even asked you. I hope you're thinking about that right now. I hope you're thinking to yourself, I can't remember even asking him. And yet I believe something about it. That is what we call eisegesis. I think there's a better way forward for us than the two paths we've chosen. And I think that way forward is to follow the God that's led us everywhere else we've been. So God's wrath is being revealed from heaven against all the ungodly behavior and the injustice of human beings who silence the truth with injustice. This is because what is known about God should be plain to them. Because God made it plain to them. Ever since the creation of the world, God, God's invisible qualities, God's eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen because they are understood through the things God has made. We call that natural theology or natural revelation, excuse me, that you can see God, understand that God exists based on God's creation. So humans are without excuse. Although they knew God, they didn't honor God or uh, they didn't honor God as God or thank him. Um, instead, their reasoning became pointless and their foolish hearts were darkened. While they were claiming to be wise, they made fools of themselves. That is true of every generation. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images that look like mortal humans, birds, animals, reptiles, idolatry. So God abandoned them to their heart's desires, which led to the moral corruption of degrading their bodies with each other. They traded God's truth for a lie, and they worshiped and served the creation instead of the creator who is blessed forever. When we go to majority rule without going to God, what is it that we're doing there? We're seeking the will of the what versus the what. The creation instead of the creator. Now, does that mean we're never supposed to make decisions? No. Ever since Eden, God has been teaching us that we have to make decisions. We're just supposed to do that with him. It's when we do it without him that there's a problem. 
That's why God abandoned them, abandoned them to degrading lust. Their females traded natural sexual relations for unnatural sexual relations. Also in the same way, the males traded natural sexual relations with females and burned with lust for each other. Males performed shameful actions with males and they were paid back with the penalty they deserved for the mistake in their own bodies. Yeah. Okay, so she asked why, why the word abandoned is used there so many times because we're taught that God will never abandon or forsake us. The point Paul is making is that people chose, people chose to focus on the creation rather than the creator. Paul's saying that's a human choice. So when he's saying that God abandoned them, you need to read that in a different context. What he's saying is essentially God honored their choice. And the result of their choice was that they were led away from God. When you're led away from God, here's what the, the result of those actions are. So everything Paul is listing there is a, a common, commonly accepted evil of his world. He does not know that he needs to justify that this kind of sexual relation is wrong because there's nobody other than the people that he would consider to be depraved and would engage in that, nobody else would even argue that it was wrong. He doesn't know he needs to justify that because his culture is different. So his point is actually hugely different than what we read out of this because we approach it with predefined uh, belief systems. We want to see what the Bible says about homosexuality. Paul's not trying to make a case about homosexuality. He doesn't think he needs to. He's trying to make a totally different case, and that is when you exchange God for an idol, he says that by saying we focus on the creation rather than the creator, then we end up not knowing what the right thing to do is because we put our trust in something other than God, and that leads to a natural, uh, what he would call a natural depravity. Does that make sense? Since they didn't think it was worthwhile to acknowledge God, God abandoned them to a defective mind to do inappropriate things. So they were filled with all injustice, wicked behavior, greed, and evil behavior. They are full of jealousy, murder, fighting, deception, and malice. They are gossips, they slander people, and they hate God. They are rude and proud, and they brag. They invent ways to be evil, and they are disobedient to their parents. Now, if you want to know... Uh, if you want to, to, to draw a correlation again between hot button topics and political issues and the actual message of scripture, just take into consideration the fact that we are not having a debate right now about whether or not it is legal to be proud or rude or brag, or whether we're going to sanction that behavior or not in the church, whether that behavior will officially be considered sin and leave you to, lead you to hell, in spite of the fact that it is in exactly the same passage where Paul is talking about homosexuality. They're full of jealousy, murder, fighting, deception, malice. They're gossips. They, if we were judged for gossip, we would be in trouble. They slander people. They hate God. They're rude and they're proud. They brag. They invent ways to be evil. That's it, that. They invent ways. Like, they aren't enough, so they invent ways to be evil. And they're disobedient, and they're disobedient to their parents. They're without understanding, disloyal, without affection, without mercy. They, though they know God's decision that those who persist in such practices deserve death. They not only keep doing these things, but also approve of others who practice them. That last phrase is really important. They also approve of others who practice them. I've heard it said that I don't need to make a decision about how I feel about homosexuality because it doesn't affect me. I'm heterosexual. Um, scholars who write about this say that the approval of something that is contrary to God's will is a worse act even than engaging in it. Yeah, it leads to a lot of questions, doesn't it? Am I going to go to hell? Yeah, you know, it, 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 Does that mean I'm wrong? It's a hard, it's a hard thing to, because it's a hard thing 
Yeah, this is, uh, this is such an important topic. I'm going to go ahead and talk for a minute, and I want you to feel free to, to take off if you need to take off, because usually I try to get you out of here at a quarter till or, or noon. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and talk today, because this is something we're all struggling with. You will not offend me if you need to leave. Um, I'm not, I am not, um, what's the right phrase? Divulging something that I am not allowed to divulge by telling you that I have a gay daughter because she's very vocal about that. Samantha, who's with her dad right now, is, is gay. Um, my answer to your question is this. I am a person who's well aware of what the scriptures say. I'm also a person who is well aware of what the purpose of the scripture is which is to do what? What is the purpose of the scripture? Say that again, please. The purpose of the scripture is to bring me, yeah, make me aware of God and bring me closer to God, help me to understand how to know God um, until I get to that point where I'm, I'm doing that, right? Now, do the scriptures lose their value once I know God? No, they don't. God still communicates to me through the scriptures even though I know God. But when I want to know what to do, where do you think I go first? I go to God. Now, I'm also going to go to the scriptures, but I, but I go to God for the same reason that God is a real being, right? We've got to wrap our minds around that. So you have a relationship with God in the same way you have a relationship with any other real being. So if I want to know what Kate thinks, I'm, I'm going to go. I may look through her emails and text messages, but I'm going to go to Kate, right? Um <coughs> They really are pretty boring, so I probably wouldn't spend much time in them. But that said, so if I want to know what Kate thinks, yeah, sure, I can do that. Or would they be helpful? They'd actually be incredibly helpful. Anything Kate ever wrote, she's writing a blog. You need to get on her blog when she finishes it because it's really pretty awesome. She is doing this experiment where she's taking a year to redefine what she thinks Christian living could look like, and it's pretty spectacular. Her first month was devoted to time and her second month was devoted to relationships. So when she gets that up and running, you should read it. It's, it's been powerful and it's changed her. But if I, if I didn't know Kate, then yeah, I'd look at anything she wrote, right? Or anything anybody wrote about her. If, if I know Kate, I may still look at those things. I'm gonna read her book when it comes out and I'm probably gonna know her better as a result of reading it. But I'm also still gonna go to her. Why am I saying this? Because it's the only metaphor that works in terms of understanding how to do this. Um, do I believe that it is possible to go to hell? Absolutely. Do you know what I think it is that will get you to hell? Say, uh, Kate said your decision to go there. Would you, would you say more about that while I look up the verse I want? Um, <clears throat> Paul writes that we'll be purified of our sin as if by fire. Um, what does that mean? <clears throat> he says that the things you've done, if they're, not, if they're not able to withstand the flame, they'll be burnt away. But you will survive as one who went through the fire. It's like a cleansing. Uh, the motif is a cleansing motif. So what does that mean? Um, we have a tendency to teach people that we are going to go to hell because of our sin when Jesus clearly says that you go to hell because you chose you didn't want to have a relationship with me. It's more like, again, with regard to the abandonment uh, statement, God is honoring your choice. You don't want to be with God. God's not going to make you be with God, right? Um, do you think you're going to know everything about who God is by the day that you die? No. I mean, you're going to be lacking. You're going to be having done some things that you shouldn't have done that separated you from God. Of course that'll be the case because you're probably not going to be a fully self-actualized, perfect human being by the day you die. Right. Right. So, um, and... Uh, this is a long way to get to the answer to your question, but that's because I think that it's important that we understand how to find the answer. You give a person a fish and they'll eat. You teach a person how to fish and they won't be hungry again. Um, I believe that the answer to your question is that we go to God. I, I don't think there's a single woman who's, 
who's going to go to hell because she's wearing jewelry. I just don't think that. And quite frankly, if women have to learn in silence with full submission or else they're going to hell, Kate has no hope. There is no hope whatsoever that she will be saved, right? So does that mean, does that, mean that I am contradicting the Bible? Um, no, I don't think so. I think Paul was trying to make a statement there based on his life. So the next question you're going to have is, okay, Matt, do you think homosexuality is okay? I think the answer to that question is you, you need to go to God. I think you need to go to God and say, how do you, God, want me to interact with this person? Because their choice to be gay is not my choice to make, yeah, right? I've always kind of looked at it like this. <coughs> now that I'm actually more religious, I've always, you know, I just have to figure out how to love her and accept her. And I, I kind of have to wonder, I kind of see it when I love her and have to give up. Sure. Right. You accept her and you're not going to judge her because it's not your job, which I want others to hear. And, that, and I think that's a wise way to approach that. Um, John Wesley said, now, it's not my, it is my decision to be gay or not to be gay. Um, more appropriately, let me say it is my decision to be in relationship with whom I choose to be in relationship with. And I've clearly made that choice in my life. Um, it is, I have no authority over Samantha's decision. What I can tell you is that my answer to how I approach that is exactly the same as John Wesley's answer. I spent a long time working with my daughters so that they would grow up to be people who didn't have to be convinced that it's possible to hear God. Did any of you come to the Wednesday night prayer service? You should consider that, it's at 615. It's a 15 minute prayer service here. Um, it's guided prayer follows 878 in the back of the hymnals what we follow but there's a portion where I kneel here and I take everybody through some guided prayers so I'll say something like um, for the congregation and or for the the local community and I'll be quiet and people lays up names you know in situations well um, our show kids come to that now I don't know if you know this but we have a total of about 50 kids who come to show in groups of maybe 25 to 30 a Wednesday right so there's 25 to 30 kids sitting up here. It's probably two or three months ago, they started kneeling up here with me. And, and now every Wednesday, there is a whole row of kids that kneel next to me as we pray. It's gotten to the point where um, when you go to Korea and you pray together as a group, the pastor starts the prayer and then everybody prays out loud at the same time. It's, it's an amazing experience. But in America, we want to let you talk and when you're done, then I'm going to talk. These kids are lifting up prayer requests constantly. There is not a break in between their prayer requests. So other church members are having to lift prayer requests up while their prayer requests are being lifted up. Why am I saying this? Because we're raising a generation of children who don't think that it is strange to talk to God. They, they won't think that's weird because they're doing it here. I took a great pains, and to teach my daughters how to know God and how to hear his voice. I trust Samantha to talk to God about who God is calling Samantha to be. My responsibility in that relationship is to talk to God about who God wants me to be in my relationship with her. Now, does that mean that there will never come a time when I will ever say to Samantha, Samantha, I, whatever it is, you know, either you're doing something that I think might be uh, dangerous for you. Sure, I've said that to her, like, specifically with Samantha, a whole lot more than any of the other kids in, in our family. Uh, Samantha is just a party looking for a place to happen. And, um, but I will tell you that my commitment to my family and children and congregation is that I will not do that without asking God what he wants me to say. So the vast majority of the time, God has said, keep your mouth shut. And then every now and then he says, this, this is the time for you to talk and what I want you to talk about. Why am I that idealistic? Because I believe that's what the kingdom of heaven is. I have no interest. I, I, I want the kingdom of heaven to break through to earth more frequently and I don't think it will do that unless we start behaving as citizens of that kingdom 
if we do as idealistic as that is, I think we begin to change the world around us. So do I think that you're going to hell? Um, I am not qualified <laughs> to make that assessment. Yeah. And so what do you do? What I do is that I go to God. Yeah. I talk to my community of faith and my spiritual mentor. Um, God has never told me that I am not allowed to eat pork. I don't feel guilty about it. I've never felt guilty about it. I do wear jewelry, and I don't think that that's an issue. God and I have talked about those things, and I'm comfortable and confident. If there comes a day when God says to me, Matt, um, you need to stop wearing jewelry, then I will say, okay, God, uh, maybe when I get there, you and I can talk about why, because this seems really weird to me, but I'm going to do it, right? So the, there are two issues there, and, and what I'm trying to highlight is this. It is one thing to try to make something okay because we want it to be okay. It is another thing entirely to surrender your life to God and be willing to do what God says, whether you understand it or not, or whether you agree with it or not. The common denominator here is that you go to God for the answer. Um, what other questions do you have? Nobody got up and left, so I assume you wanted to hear where that was going to go, right? I'm not going to tell you that everybody who is gay is going to hell, and I'm not going to tell you that nobody who is gay is going to hell, because God did not call me to come to your congregation to tell you who is going to hell and who is not going to hell. God called me to your congregation to help you to better understand how to know him for yourself so you can ask him that question. Yeah. I'm sure it is. Yeah, I've heard that before. Uh, universal salvation. Karl Barth was a theologian um, who said that he didn't, uh, I'm sorry, for those of you who are watching, Phil said that he heard a Catholic priest say that nobody was going to hell because God is, is too good. Um, this is the theology there. Karl Barth said that everybody's going to be saved because nobody can resist God's grace ultimately, and the scriptures say that there will be a day when every knee bows and every tongue confesses. Um, sometimes I think we spend a whole lot of time trying to figure out who's going to get to heaven and in so doing miss the boat entirely uh, because I, I think that trying to make sure that you get to heaven might be one of the only ways that you can ensure that you have a hard time getting there. I, I think that um, our purpose, as I've said, is to know God. I do think there are going to be people who don't want to be with God and as a result end up going to hell and spend an eternity away from him but I'm also not God and our understanding of eschatology is limited I believe that God is a powerful enough God to do whatever God wants to do so if you ask me is it would it be possible for someday in eternity for God to go down to the depths of hell and save those who are down there um, however you envision that or save those let's say who are separated from God my answer to you would be, well, he did it once. I mean, when Christ died, he descended into the depths of hell then. So is it possible? Sure. Is God going to do it? I have no idea. I'm the wrong person to ask. God asked God that question. Um, what I know is this. I've been, I was blessed to be taught when I was young what it means to know God. And, I, and as a result of that, I've had a wonderful relationship with God for the entirety of my life. If you tell me that you don't think I can hear God, I'm going to look at you like you're as strange as if you told me I couldn't hear Kate. Why? Because I know him. Um, if you want to think that I am crazy for that, that is more than your prerogative. I happen to think that the more of us who know God and communicate with God, um, the more the world will transform, the more the kingdom will break in and it'll move us closer to that day when there is a new heaven and a new earth. I think that is our mission as Christians. So when it comes to my daughter, I don't spend any time trying to decide what's going to happen to her in eternity. I've spent time trying to teach her to know God so that she can work that relationship with God out for herself, which is what I believe our call is. 
and then I love her in the way that God has called me and taught me to love her as she becomes the person that God is calling her to be. Um, I hope that helps to answer some of your questions. My suspicion is that if you were looking for me to say this or this, then you're frustrated. Um, there is no, yeah, there's no this or this. And, and I would, uh, I enjoy taking issue with, with, I enjoy having a good, let me say, a vigorous discussion with, with those of us who do want to be more black and white than the reality of our lives seems to indicate that we actually are. What I believe is, as I said at the beginning, that the debate has become evil. I think the end result of this debate is the destruction of the church, and that makes me wonder whose will it is that we're doing. What I think the valid and salient point is, is that if, if we know God and seek out his will, then God will tell us what to do. Will everybody on earth do that? No, but right now everybody on earth doesn't do everything the right way or a good way anyway. That's, I mean, we live in a broken world. All right, is there anything burning on your heart? I kept you late, and my stomach is grumbling. Ah. If there's, did we lose it? Okay. Is there anything else that you want to say before we go? Then let me, um, let me close you out with this. It is okay if you're sitting in the pew or you're watching online and you fall into the category of people who aren't really sure how you're supposed to feel about this yet, that, that's all right. When you're at a point in life where you're trying to figure out what God wants you to do, I think that it is wise, so long as you have this, this gift, I think that it is wise not to do anything until you know what it is that God wants you to do. And so if you're struggling with this, I would, I would encourage you to continue to struggle, but have that struggle together with God so that God can be the one who guides you through um, or toward becoming who he's calling you to be. All right, let's go ahead and close with some prayer, and then I will see you next week unless you're really angry about homosexuality, and then I will be praying for you and hope that you're here next week. Gracious and giving God, thank you for being a God who loves us in the way that you do. Thank you for being a God who exists beyond our understanding and beyond our, our ability to comprehend. God, to know that there is a mystery to who you are, and we're grateful for that. We pray, God, that as we leave this place today, that you would help us to continue to process um, what we are learning and what we're struggling with. Help us to continue to process who you are, who you're calling us to be, and how you are calling us to interact with the people in the world that you've blessed us with. God, we don't want to be a people who try to make something okay that is not okay. And we also don't want to be a people who forget that you are a God who has always helped us to better understand how we are supposed to live and love together in the world that you put us in. Help us to be a people who follow you faithfully, Lord, in your holy name. Amen. All right, friends, thank you for coming.